Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Marijka hunter -Rosselman. I'm from the Division for Research Development at Stellenbosch University, and I would like to welcome you to this next lecture, which is part of our Stellenbosch, Stellenbosch Forum lecture series. Um, this series was started in 1990, and the idea is to give opportunities to our staff and our students as well as interested people from the public to learn more about the relevant uh, world-class research that is being done at, at uh, Stellenbosch University. Our researchers are requested to present their academic research uh, topics in such a way that's understandable to non-experts in the field. Um, so it gives the ideal opportunity for critical debate and interesting discussions across disciplinary boundaries. This year, for the first time, we have a theme for our series, uh, which is called Changing Climates. And the idea is to tackle uh, topics um, uh, around this, uh, you know, changing um, uh, environments and the influences of it. Um, and we tackle topics um, associated with natural resources, health, education, history, economies and theology, um, as you will see today and then how research can be impactful in finding possible solutions in such rapidly changing um, settings. So today um, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Dion Foster. Uh, Dion is a professor in public theology and ethics. Um, he serves as the chair of the Department of Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology, and he is the director of the Bayer's Nodea Center for Public Theology in the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch. Um, he holds a PhD in New Testament studies and in systematic theology, and much of his research focuses on the intersections of faith and public health uh, uh, and public life. Sorry, uh, Dion, thank you very much again for your willingness to participate in our series. We look forward to the talk. Um, I would like to ask everybody to please make sure that your cameras are off and that you are muted for the duration. Um, of the session, we will have um, time um, after Dion's presentation for discussion, and then you're welcome to put, put on your mics um, and to take part in the discussion as well. Dion, thank you very much again from my side. Over to you. Mareika, thanks uh, so much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, friends, colleagues. It's a wonderful privilege to be with you uh, this afternoon, and I hope you've got your coffee and uh, perhaps something ready uh, for the lunch hour. Um, but first of all, just to say my uh, thanks to the Division for Research Development. Um, Mareika, thank you to you for the help that you've given to Whitney Prince and to Dr. Tarina Taron for the opportunity to present uh, this form, uh, uh, forum lecture. And um, today I'm going to be engaging the notion of changing climates by looking specifically at the ways in which the changing climate of religion is working uh, in, in certain Christian contexts in South Africa. And I'm wanting particularly to adopt a public theological uh, critique or approach on the way in which uh, religion is changing for many Africans and how this impacts our individual and social lives uh, on the continent. Now, I'd like to begin just with a, a, a little story. Um, on the 20th of January, 2021, um, I had an article published uh, in the conversation, which is a sort of uh, online uh, news source for academics. And the title of the article, which you can see there is Trump is out, but US evangelicalism remains alive and well in Africa. Now, the response to this article was quite remarkable, in part, I think, because of the timing of its release. Uh, I think the editors <laughs> were wise in choosing when and how to release it. It was published less than two weeks after the public and very concerning events surrounding the storming of the United States Capitol on the 6th of January 2021. But in addition to that, the 20th of January was also the day on which former President Donald Trump was set to leave office and the elected President Joe Biden was to take office. Within a matter of hours, uh, the article had been republished by 15 uh, newspapers uh, across the continent and the world and in online journals, and it was shared more than 500 times on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, to date, I think it's got close to uh, about 15 persons who've read it. Now, for a theological article, 
written by a South African author. This is what we would call uh, a somewhat viral response. And it was interesting to see the deeply polarized responses that emerged in the comments and messages related to the article. Some Christians from African countries and some Christians from the United States were appreciative of the article's content, affirming some of the elements of what had been written and sharing their concerns over how some African Christian groupings were uncritically adopting American political commitments. Others, however, were deeply critical of the, uh, of the article and its contents, and some even launched personal attacks on, on myself and my character, uh, one or two even threatening bodily harm, which was quite interesting. What was clear was that the article had struck a nerve. And on various sides of the theological spectrum, Christians around the globe clearly held strong feelings and views about the relationship between African Christianities and American evangelicalism. Now, just this last week, um, I noted that South Africans shouldn't be surprised if the proposed overturning of Roe versus Wade in the United States very quickly began to impact the rights and freedoms of South African women. And lo and behold, we've had reports already from Ghana, from Uganda, Nigeria, and South Africa, that some funding instruments are now being called into question if th those who receive the funding either from the US state or from NGOs, non-governmental organizations, or FBOs, faith-based organizations, are in any way uh, attached to clinics that offer uh, abortions. Now, what's particularly concerning about this is that we can see that this is an element of political theology. And just to acknowledge, I saw uh, one of the attendees on our lecture today is Professor Marcia Pally. Uh, Marcia, thanks for joining today. And Marcia has published what I think is probably the most up-to-date and important book on this topic. It's entitled White Evangelicals and Right-Wing Populism, published by Routledge uh, just a few weeks ago. And in her book, um, she shows how this political agenda amongst some white evangelicals has a global intention and appeal. And we can certainly see this in South Africa, where a number of our prominent church leaders, uh, prominent Christian leaders, but also uh, a number of our prominent political leaders associate themselves either with overtly uh, American evangelical uh, groupings or churches that come from those groupings, such as the Rhema Bible Church or the Grace Bible Church. And they are uncritically informed by American evangelical political theologies. Some of them, of course, um, are facing direct pressure from congressmen and uh, members of, of the US government who themselves hold evangelical leanings and are shaping the way in which funding and policy is shared with contexts such as ours. So in today's lecture, we're going to consider and uh, critically evaluate some historical and theological insights that exist between African evangelical Christianities and American evangelical Christian groupings. And the intention is particularly to understand and trace uh, why this should be concerning for Africans. Now, I want to begin, first of all, with a little bit of a confession. And this is to say that um, my concerns are the concerns of something of an insider. Um, I'm a Christian theologian um, who comes from a denomination that could be classified uh, in some circles as both African and evangelical. Uh, I'm a member of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. I'm not going to go through these uh, points. I've published articles on these elsewhere, which if you're interested to receive them, uh, you, you can find them there. But these are more or less the sort of traits of uh, contemporary evangelicalism. And it's interesting to notice uh, in, in Bebbington's uh, criteria, the fourth one is that one of uh, activism. And certainly we are seeing that, um, that activism is, is an important part of contemporary evangelicalism. And then the final one, uh, which we see there under Stackhouse's criteria, the notion of transdenominationalism, and I would even say uh, transnationalism is a very important one. The, the point that I want to make is that um, as a, a person who comes from a historically evangelical tradition, I understand this notion that... Um, the, the appeals of the gospel, the good news, what it means to live 
the kind of life which which persons would think is good um, are not curtailed by national borders or national laws. And if they are considered to be good and right, even though they can be called into question, um, persons often use whatever means they can, whatever influence they have, not only their religious and theological influence, but very often the positions that they hold in society, for example, political influence or economic influence to see them achieved. Now, let's spend a bit of time looking at some of the background on the influence of American evangelicalism on African Christianities. Now, I share Nico Koopman's conviction that the church, and I quote, and the Christian faith exists in public, is part of it, and impacts both knowingly and unknowingly on public life. Moreover, I acknowledge that religion has played an ambiguous role in Africa, and at times it's offered meaning and hope and fostered resilience, but at other times it's led to conflict, the deepening of prejudices, and the hampering of social and scientific process, process, progress. In this sense, I share Sunday Agung's commitment to a constructive and responsible, uh, what he calls, public theology. Now, Agung claims that what Africa needs, and Africa remains a deeply religious continent, is not just a theology that uh, is concerned with um, the aspects of a particular faith, but the kind of theology that takes cognizance of human knowledge, understanding that faith in God can translate into deep moral commitments and to the building of a better society that understands the notion of the common good, that is committed to love, to justice, and to wisdom. And Agung claims that this is what uh, a public theology should be. However, I want to acknowledge that not all public theologies are constructive or in the interests of the common good. And I want to give two examples of this from the South African context. The first one comes from the Re Reverend Kenneth Meshu, the leader of the African Christian Democratic Party, who released this tweet on the 2nd of November 2020, the day before the American elections. And we can see there that in the tweet he says, please pray for President Donald Trump to be re-elected as the President of the United States of America. Now, when I first became aware of this tweet, I found it quite bizarre. How is it that a black African Christian could support a seemingly overtly racist person with question, questionable morals and a disdain for people who come from what he calls shithole countries? Now, some research and analysis has shown that Meshu's uh, reasons for supporting Trump are both political and theological in nature. He indicates that he's praying for a Trump victory, and I quote, because of Trump's support for the natural family, his respect for human life, his love for his country, the protection of religious freedoms, and Trump's opposition to a global plan called the Great Reset, end quote. Now, Meshu's reasoning touches upon traditional evangelical social concerns, such as the natural family, which relates to heterosexual marriage, and being opposed to abortion. However, he also lists some more contemporary political concerns, such as patriotism and the protection of religious rights, and an opposition to the economic plan called the Great Reset. Now, the entanglement of moral and political issues has become a common feature in evangelical public life. That Meshu urged persons to pray for Trump's victory shows that he intertwines religious conviction with political ideology. It's important to note that he is calling people to prayer, and this is an expression of a political theology. Clearly, he believes that God shares his political views since he is calling upon God to use God's sovereign power to secure a victory for a particular political party and candidate, and thereby enact the political values and commitments that he believes Donald Trump holds in common with his evangelical theological commitments. Now, these values and commitments seem to be of greater importance than some of Donald Trump's deeply problematic moral lapses in relation to the sanctity of marriage, issues of racism, the evidence of corruption, and financial impropriety. And this phenomenon has become known in uh, theological research as the Cyrus effect. 
In the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, in Isaiah 45, we read that God appoints King Cyrus as a ruler, I quote, whose right hand God has grasped to subdue the nations before him, end quote. At the launch of a grouping called Evangelicals for Trump in January 2020, a leader of the movement, movement Apostle Guillermo Maldonado, prayed, and I quote, Father, I pray for our president. We ask you, Father, that he can be the Cyrus to bring reformation, to bring change into this nation, and that all the nations of the earth will say, America is the greatest nation on earth. Now, this prayer, like Meshu's call for prayer, betrays a political agenda. Like Meshu, Maldonado believes that Donald Trump will lead the US and the whole world in a socio-political reformation that aligns with his take on evangelical doctrinal and moral commitments. And as we shall see shortly, these commitments are anchored in the myth of American theological exceptionalism, which places the nation ahead of the gospel. Now, the second example that uh, we have of a misguided political theology that is formed by some commitments found in contemporary evangelical theologies comes from the former South African government official and former Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, Mukhweng Mukhweng. Mukhweng has wide ranging support among South African evangelical Christians, and this is largely based on his support for the big issues of traditional marriage, heteronormative beliefs, and in his case, the support of the nation state of Israel. He was invited to speak at a public event that was hosted to honor frontline medical workers who had faced inordinate challenges during the coronavirus pandemic. And he attended this event in his official capacity uh, representing his office. And in that uh, responsibility, he is to uphold the values of the constitution of South Africa. He has a responsibility to safeguard South Africa's national well-being and not represent his personal religious or political views. However, at that event, uh, he offered this prayer, which you can see on the screen. Um, in particular, I just want to draw attention to one or two things. He says, Lord, uh, I judge it. I run it down in the name of Jesus. I lock down every demon of COVID-19. I lock out any vaccine that is not of you. If there is any vaccine that is of the devil, meant to infuse 666 in the lives of people, meant to corrupt their DNA, any such vaccine, Lord Almighty, may it be destroyed by fire. Now, this prayer, as you can imagine, caused significant concern amongst medical professionals, politicians, Christian leaders, and theologians. And he was accused of undermining public confidence in vaccines that were being administered to South Africans. Now, research shows that views suggesting that vaccines contain the number of the beast, 666, are directly attributable to beliefs that emerged in some fringe American evangelical movements. These groupings are known to be uh, skeptical of contemporary medicine in general and vaccination in particular, relying on the misrepresentation of apocalyptic imagery that comes from the book of Revelation in the New Testament. As we shall see, these views are also related to a particular kind of political theology that is linked to the founding myth of America during the American War of Independence, that this nation was to be established by God as an exceptional example of Christian nationhood. Yet contemporary African evangelical Christians, such as Mukhweng, are not aware of the ways in which their theology is being shaped by a foreign political theology that does not have the aims or interests of Africans at heart. It's worth noting that both Meshu and Mukhweng Mukhweng are ordained pastors of evangelical Christian movements, and that both of them served as leaders of Christian communities before entering political life. Both attribute their shift from pastoral ministry to politics as a form of divine calling. As we shall also see, both men have theological ties, ties to American evangelical groupings. Now, what is deeply concerning is that Meshu and Mukhweng's views are shared by many African evangelicals. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, that too much, but just to say Damaris Parsitao, uh, a Harvard uh, researcher, uh, noted this. She said, for many evangelical clergy, 
science, climate change, and evangelical issues are not top of their agenda. They would rather pray for healing for ailments such as cancer, COVID-19, diabetes, and HIV, AIDS, asthma, and many others. Belief in science and medicine could seriously threaten their booming faith he healing miracle industry, rendering many jobless. Now, I'm a little bit less uh, scathing in, in my view. I, I tend to hold a slightly different view. Uh, Mohueng Mohueng, for example, would suffer no financial loss. I think in the case of many African evangelicals, uh, they've been said, fed a diet of theological half-truths and heresies that inadvertently create a deep antagonism towards medical treatment and common, uh, common sense. Now, in order to understand this, we need to take a further move, and we need to deal with this notion of what has become known as Trumpism. Now, Reverend Meshu, Bishop Mark Kuriaki from Kenya, the head of the Evangelical Alliance and other African evangelical Christians who pledged their unequivocal political and religious support for Donald, Donald Trump must have been deeply disappointed when he was ousted from the White House. His legal team faced numerous defeats in their bid to overturn the results of the 2020 election. And Twitter users mockingly speculated that perhaps the African angels that Trump's dubious spiritual advisor, Paula White, called upon to secure the Trump presidential victory when it appeared that he had already lost the vote, could not get visas in time to help the president win his second term. The claim that the United States election has been fraudulent was not only supported by American evangelicals, but Parsitao notes that a number of African evangelicals have also adopted this idea. The question is, of course, how is it possible that such prominent and widely regarded African Christian leaders and their followers would so uncritically support Trump's presidency, his politics and values? The answer is that it all points to a rather bizarre tale at the intersections of politics, economics, and the spreading of a political theology that is aligned to American evangelicalism. Now, what is certain is that even though Donald Trump has left the White House, Trumpism as a phenomenon continues to have a significant and destructive effect on global politics, economic, and social life. And Africa and Africans are not immune. Um, so Trumpism is a sort of catch-all phrase that loosely denotes the kind of political, economic, and religious ideology that characterized the Trump presidency. It is not only contained in the person of Donald Trump or indeed in the United States of America. It's also commonly used to refer to leaders who employ similar political, economic, and religious rhetoric uh, in nationalist and populist uh, dialogue. This includes such as divisive political views, ident identity politics that's anchored in problematic views on race, gender, and class distinctions, nationalisms of various kind, which are thinly veiled as patriotism, and of course, a series of reason-defying beliefs and convictions that touch on everything from secretive global organizations like QAnon to science denialism in relation to climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Christians from historical Christian traditions around the world have been astounded and deeply critical of how evangelical Christians have supported Trump and the Trump administration over the last four years. The sad reality, of course, is that the world's poorest citizens, amongst them Africa's, Africans, are the ones who suffer most from the effects of climate change, the uh, um, unjust trade policies of the United States, and the increase in global inequalities, the spreading of racism, and the entrenchment of abusive gender relationships. So let's move our next step. How did American evangelicalism uh, come to be adopted by so many African Christians? Where do these beliefs stem from, and how were they adopted? To understand this, we need to acknowledge that African religiosity, which predates the arrival of Christian mission, has some coherences with some beliefs and practices of evangelical Christianity. We need to consider also the historical period in which evangelical Christianities first spread to Africa with the sending of evangelical missionaries from America and Europe. Tony Balcom suggests that American evangelicalism um, resonates 
both with the spirituality um, of Africa and the materialism and individual individualism of modernity. And we'll unpack that in a moment. Experiential religion is characterized by an appeal to the supernatural, to things such as healing, to miracles, and to visions, which are all part of African religious experience. And these religious experiences predate the arrival of Christian missionaries. As John Mbiti noted in his book, Concepts of God in Africa, I quote, African people were not religiously illiterate. Indeed, Africans were religious long before the arrival of the first and second wave Christian missionaries. However, it was when the so-called third wave evangelical Christianity arrived from America and Britain that it appeared to be much more appealing to African religious sentiments than the dry and reasoned second wave faith that was brought by Catholic, Reformed, Methodist, and Anglican missionaries. Experiential religion was far more appealing than the somewhat rational and reasoned faith that was brought by the, the Protestants. Now, evangelical Christianity also relates to this period known as modernism. And Balcom notes, the existential reality of, of Africans is that they live in a world that is powerfully influenced by the forces of both modernism and pre-modernism. Evangelicalism enables them to transact between these forces in a way uh, that they find helpful and even liberating. Evangelical Christianity allows many Africans to build a bridge between um, what someone like uh, Charles Taylor might call the enchanted view of reality. Moreover, it connects spiritual realities and the realities of living in a politically and economically globalized world to one another. Now, this is important for us to note. Balcom's second point is that the arrival of American evangelicalism in Africa coincided with the historical emergence of rampant materialism and individualism, which are characteristics of modernity, and that were deeply embedded in American Christianities of the time. Evangelical Christianities ushered in a renewed sense of agency for African Christianity, who lived within a complex set of spiritual forces such as ancestors, evil spirits, curses, and of course, contemporary socio-political and socio-economic forces. This is clearly, as we shall see, a form of political theology. Balcom notes, an evangelical understanding of the gospel claims that the risen Christ has brought all of the principalities and powers under his control. To receive Christ is therefore to, predict, to bring the control that Christ has to the individual in such a way that she or he is un, was unable to enjoy under the previous regime. The liberation and subsequent empowerment that the believer experiences in this transaction gives a new sense of agency in a world where individualism is paramount. That is the modern world and into which the evangelical believer fits hand in glove because evangelicalism acts in concert with three essential forces of modernity. The centrality of the individual, a mastery over nature, and the disenchantment of the universe. Now, one can bring about changes in the seen world, according to Balcom, by placing it under the Lordship of Christ, who will enact the necessary changes in the spiritual realm. That was what we saw Kenneth Meshu praying for. Now, such a transactional view of religion predates the arrival of Christianity in Africa. We know that the importance of appeasing the ancestors, of warding off evil forces, and of using religious rituals and sacrifices to achieve such means is part and parcel of African indigenous religiosity. However, what is new is that these beliefs are now infused with a political and economic view that stems from outside of Africa. It comes from the American evangelical political worldview, and it's shaped by the American experience of modernity. Perhaps the most destructive and pervasive telos of this has been the emergence of what is called the prosperity gospel. And these are fundamentally transactions seeking to gain wealth, social prominence, and, and political transformation by spiritual practices such as sacrificial given, giving and reason-denying acts of faith 
that lead to personal and social miracles. Now, here's an important point that I want us uh, to pay some attention to. It's important to understand that from its birth, American evangelicalism has been uh, allied to the notion of the American dream. And just to say again, um, I think Marcia Pally's book, the most recent book, is very, very instructive on this, but also her earlier book, uh, Commonwealth and Covenant. The myth of the founding of America is central to American evangelicalism. And it's a political theology that claims that God established America as an exceptional nation that overcame political and religious tyranny and oppression through the American Revolution. It has deep social and psychological roots that can be traced to quasi-historical and theological narratives that support the founding of the myth of the United States. Now, what is American exceptionalism? It's the long-standing belief that the United States is an inherent force for good in the world. And this ideology emerged from the dominant narration of the founding of the country, often termed the American Revolution. Now, in Pally's Commonwealth and Covenant, um, political uh, uh, economics, politics, and the the theologies of relation relationality, she offers one of the finest presentations of the theological and political foundations in the emergence of conte contemporary American identities. Pally traces the historical emergence of its distinction amid relationship or separability amid situatedness as a key factor in her book. What is characteristic of our American identity is the way in which personhood is constructed in relation to God and others. Americans and America have internalized the belief that they are historically exceptional and that their endeavor, endeavors for liberation from author, authoritarianism built on the foundations of rugged individualism, a frontier mentality of God-ordained progress and the establishment of a form of Western civilization, which of course is a form of American democracy, liberty and freedom present the apex of human history. And this theopolitical identity is nowhere more prominent than in the claim, God bless America. It constitutes a theological acclaim. It is an expression of a form of civil religion that is deeply political in nature. It presumes that the God of this statement is uniquely aligned to the aspirations, ideals, and commitments of the American political and economic apparatus. In this view, the kingdom of God is uncritically subsumed into the economic uh, progress of the American dream and the global enforcement of American social values and political ideals. Now, the internalization of such exceptional beliefs appear to be uh, to form the basis upon which Donald Trump and his supporters, who view themselves as, I quote, evangelical patriots, have pushed back against measures, for example, to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Notice the kind of language that was used. First, the virus was called a foreign virus. Trump went so far as to call it a Chinese virus. Later, it was characterized as a political host, hoax brought about by the democratic uh, opposition. When its presence and influence could no longer be denied, common sense and scientific reason were placed in conflicts with the claims of evangelical faith. These included contesting measures such as the wearing of face masks, maintaining social distance, and acting in ways that responsibly protect vulnerable persons from infection while min minimizing unnecessary social, economic, and public engagements. Samuel L. Perry and colleagues noted in their research, I quote, that the COVID, in the COVID-19 pandemic, Americans' behavioral responses very quickly became politicized. Those on the left stressed precautionary behaviors, while those on the religious right were more likely to disregard recommended precautions. Now, the, the important thing here, what we, what we recognize is that when persons appeal to, uh, to this kind of view, how they are to react, um, what they were doing is not relating to research in medicine, but rather adopting a form of political theology. The important thing was what they were trying to establish was the right to individual freedom and liberty. And what is particularly interesting 
uh, is the nature of the political theologies that inform these views. These positions that are adopted by some American evangelicals seem not to reflect on theologies of health or sickness or disease, as we see also in the case of Meshu and Mohueng, but rather they stem from an overarching political theology that is focused on a form of American Christian nationalism. Now, American Christian nationalism is an ideology that idealizes, I quote, and advocates the fusion of American uh, civic life with a particular type of Christian identity and culture. The political commitment of the American nation by these groups is based specifically on theological views and political commitments to global exceptionalism. Now, this is where American evangelicalism becomes somewhat dangerous. Because they believe God is on their side and they have subsumed their faith into the American dream, they believe that God wants America to succeed over all nations, even over a global pandemic. In Donald Trump's inaugural speech, which focused on the widely contested theme of America first and make America great again, he captured the, the spirit of this kind of American exceptionalism, saying, and I quote, we are protected and we will always be protected. And most of all, we will be protected by God. Paula White's prayer at the same inauguration summed up this religiously infused political exceptionalism. She prayed, and I quote, let these United States of America be a beacon of hope to all people and nations under your dominion, O God, a true hope for humankind. Now, for those of us who are theologians, we like to pay attention to the syntax and the grammar of such statements. Pay attention to the theological grammar of Paula White's claim. In her prayer, the nation, the United States of America, is presented to be the true hope of humankind. This is clearly a theology in which Paula White has displaced Jesus as the hope of humanity and replaced Christ with the hope in the American nation. Now, what is certain is that Trump's God is not the God of historical Christianity. Rather, this is some kind of American God. And what is being espoused here is not Christianity, but a form of American civil religion. You see, the God of Christianity does not prefer Americans over Mexicans or over Africans. And no nation can claim God for themselves. So we can see religion and politics are deeply and uncritically intertwined in this kind of evangelicalism. And American evangelicalism, unfortunately, has become the unquestioned software that allows the hardware of American exceptionalism to spread throughout the world by means of donor aid and patronage. And this is the next and last section of the presentation today. As it spread, it took with it a non-rational, highly individualistic and deeply materialistic political theology. Um, American evangelicals were spreading not only Christianity throughout the world, but they were propagating their social, political, and economic values as part of their faith. They viewed all of the world through the lens of their political and economic uh, commitments to American nationalism. And these have become deeply intertwined in their theological values and beliefs. Um, in the paper, uh, and just to say I, I published a paper on this, um, I mention a number of examples of this that range from things uh, all, the, all you know, uh, such as uh, Donald Trump's moving of the U.S. Emb embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, but also the way in which funding was channeled in Africa uh, to to certain NGOs and faith-based organizations. Now, it's not surprising that if evangelical uh, African evangelical groupings. Um, continue to receive significant funding from American evangelical or evangelical supporting agencies. And this funding often comes with requirements, such as those discussed earlier. Some donors require African re recipients to prescribe to certain doctrinal or at least moral commitments, and others simply will not fund a project or initiative that is viewed to challenge or question the core theological or ideological commitments of the funder. Then there are many, many African evangelical leaders who were trained at American evangelical theological institutions. And understandably, 
they adopt or at least subscribe to the values of these institutions at which they studied. Reverend Meshu, for example, studied at an evangelical Bible school in Tennessee. Um, yeah, and, and just to say, uh, Mukhweng Mukhweng belongs to a church uh, which, which comes from the Rhema movement uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay, so what are we to do with this? This is where we land it. Um, we're concluding now. Uh, this is normally where people say, thank God and amen. This is the conclusion. So what are we to learn from this? The subtitle of today's presentation was a cautionary tale of theopolitical exceptionalism. And this is what I think we should learn. We should learn to be cautious of American evangelical political theologies that not only perpetuate heresy, but also a form of American imperialism. What is clear is that evangelicalism has had an important and in many cases very positive influence upon the world. And this is certainly true for Africa and African Christianities. For those who are Christian, it's often led to a renewal of the Christian faith in Africa, and it's done a great deal to contribute towards the development of many communities economically, in terms of food security, education, medical support, and many other things, the building of hospitals, schools, and clinics. Yet, it can also be argued, as we've done above, that evangelical mission also has uncritically transplanted sets of cultural, political, economic, and moral beliefs that are more American than they are Christian. And these values often place America first, and often do so in ways that mask this intention in theological and uh, language and religious activity. So what should we do? Well, first, it is both unwise and problematic to adopt a binary or overly simplistic view of African evangelicalism. Clearly, not all African evangelical leaders or evangelical communities are the same. Not all African evangelical uh, Christians emerge from or have been co-opted by American evangelical ideals. And I name a number of those in the printed article. Second, where we identify the presence of new, subtle, and powerful forms of American imperialism or colonialism, we should be willing to critically engage them and root out what is theologically untrue and socially destructive. The imbalances of power and the reality of global economic inequality mean that North-South partnerships remain important for Christianities in both contexts. However, African Christians should guard against being bought or captured by values and ideologies and beliefs that do not have their best interests at heart. While our American siblings can learn from our African uh, points of view, and this may help them to reshape their economic, political, and theological values. And finally, African Christians should not be naive about the role we play in, in world Christianity. African Christians and African Christian uh, movements play an important role in the establishment and propagation of both harmful and constructive beliefs and practices. Um, this is a, there, there is a great deal of contemporary research that shows that African evangelicals are jointly responsible for sending such problematic theological beliefs, such as the prosperity gospel, back to Europe and the US. So, while Donald Trump may have left the White House, we would do well to become aware of the lingering and destructive effects of Trumpism worldwide, particularly how they remain alive and active in some African Christianities. Let's interrogate the theological underpinnings of African Trump supporters by critically evaluating their beliefs, following the trails of money and patronage and power, and reconsidering considering our own contemporary and historical relationships with American evangelicalism. When we are confronted with a form of religion that looks more like the American dream than the gospel of Christ, Let's rather opt for, for principled choices based on Christianity's historical commitments to justice, peace, and the flourishing of all humanity and creation. Colleagues, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Dion. You have definitely given us a lot to think about. Um, and also, I think, raised our awareness around uh, the importance of religion in society, but also the power it has. And 
you know, and um, and also the ways in which religion can be applied in in society, and that there should be great caution also and around different perspectives. So thank you, thank you so much for that input. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions, and we have time now about 15 minutes. Uh, you are welcome to post questions either in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand. I think the um, Ruan, I see your hand first, Ruan Furi. You're welcome to go ahead. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, uh, Professor. Uh, professor. Um, this uh, it's an ex excellent paper, and um, I, I want to say a lot of things. But one question uh, that I have about um, this intersection between right-wing politics and evangelicalism is the focus on morality um, that the, the policy or the organization re regarding uh, abortion rights in the US and, and say sexuality here in, in, in Africa, um, it's, it's moral policing. And, and um, no way would you see uh, something um, being policed such as morality, uh, not economics, or, or um, anything else. So I just want to uh, hear a comment on, on that. Why the focus on, on morality? Thanks. Yeah, Ruan, thanks. And nice to see you. Uh, thanks for attending today. Yeah, I think the, the, the issue is um, most of the world's religions uh, have a, a sort of moral worldview. And I think Christianity is the same. We, we um, and, and, and I think we need to be uh, we need to be uh, understanding of that. Uh, most of the world's religions want to make a contribution to make the world a better place. And, you know, I think the same goes for evangelical Christianities. I mean, many people have lived incredibly sacrificial lives to be able to, for example, become missionaries, uh, to give sacrificially for what they believe to be the common good. My uh, concern is when there are unquestioned uh, moral commitments that have a strong political drive. And in particularly in, in the article which, which was published, I, I developed this notion that shows particularly where there are office bearers, for example, example a congressman in the United States Congress or people who oversee uh, aid or direct national policy like USAID, for example, often they allow their, their own evangelical commitments to shape uh, the sending of funding outside of the mandates of, of the nation state, uh, the sort of democratic uh, policies of the nation state. And I think that's deeply, deeply, deeply concerning uh, in South Africa. So I think this notion of moral commitment is something that we're, we're always gonna have to deal with. We'll have to evaluate moral commitments and see, do we agree with them? Don't we agree with them? Can we defend our, our moral commitments? But for me, it's that sinister element uh, you know, when people say we're going to withdraw funding from, let's say, your food security clinic or maternal health care clinic because you offer abortions, but that goes against the policy uh, of the funding instrument. That, that That's what worries me. Thank you. Um, next up was JC, and then I've got some peewee after JC. Uh, JC, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, well, uh, Professor, it is ex excellent uh, presentation, and I think that uh, your argument uh, is also very appropriate in Korean context as well as in East Asian context, where the American uh, Christianity is uh, so strong, American politics and American military presence, especially, you know, so strong. And also the Korean evangelical churches, uh, I think most of them are very similar to what you have described uh, in this argument. So I really appreciate what your critical analysis. And uh, my question is then, uh, what is the remedy for that? And what, for, for instance, in my case, you know, we all talk about as a Methodist theologian, for instance, talk, talking about Wesleyan heritage, evangelical heritage, and social religion, that heritage, social holiness. Uh, <clears throat> because Korean evangelical Methodist churches also emphasize Wesleyan heritage, but only warm-hearted person. I mean, that conversionism, 
No, that is the only emphasis. And uh, their social activism is, is a reactionary ideology, you know. So they are combined, you know, holiness and social holiness together, but in a, how to say, reactionary way. So our, what is our alternative? How to transform this wrong combination into right combination, you know, in our context, not 18th century worshiping, but 21st century, uh, you know, uh, churches, whether you are in uh, South Africa or Africa or Korea or East Asia. I think that is our common, uh, I think, how to say, that, that is our, our question, right? I don't know whether I described it right, right or not. Thank you. Professor Park, JC, thank you. And it's so lovely to see you. Thank you for, for joining uh, today and, and for that question. You know, my sense is, um, you know, I, I work within this field called public theology. And one of the approaches to uh, the discipline of public theology is, is one offered by a person called David Tracy that many would know of. And he speaks about the fact that theology uh, operates in different publics. We have a kind of church theology, which operates in a certain way. And then we have an academic theology, which is more rational, scientific. Um, it, it's not as directly uh, confessional. And then we have the public of theology at large. And I think what I was trying to illustrate in, in this paper today is that we can see that a, a form of civil religion, God bless America, has been uncritically collapsed into, into a church theology. Um, and so whilst people claim to be advocating uh, for Christian truth, which is either biblical or historical, um, often what they're presenting is a political conviction. And we see this happening, you know, all around uh, the world. It happens here in South Africa as, as well. Um, so it happens all around the world. And my hope would be that um, certainly within the churches, but also within the academy, we would be courageous enough to ask critical questions about ourselves. It's one of the reasons why I love being a Methodist theologian. I love my church enough to ask difficult questions about it. I love my tradition enough to recognize that it's not sanitary, that it's not without its problems. But my hope would certainly also be that we, we, wouldn't, be, um, we wouldn't be binary or simplistic or collapse too quickly into answers, that, that we would be patient enough to work with, with a measure of courage, with a form of, of, of theological imagination that would allow us to be able to, to envision what might a, a more just, inclusive, transformative gospel look like? Uh, and, and how do, do we move from where we are to where we need to be? So I think some of the work that we are doing this very lecture today, your participation in it, is one of the things that we could, uh, could be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, next up, we've got Simpiwi, and then I see Liam Baker and uh, is it Jill Kote? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, greetings and thanks to Prof for such a, a powerful paper. Uh, I just want to check something right at the beginning of your presentation. You mentioned that this kind of theology that is being perpetrated by the evangelicals and particular uh, Trump and others. It's kind of a, 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 what you will call, a, what you called a, a, a political theology. And, and I just want to check on, on you. If a political theology as an academic discipline, as a movement itself, is it still relevant in, in our context today? And, and if it is, what will be the ethical norms and values that you think the, theo the political theology, as it's been spoken about Smith and others, what would be its relevance today and particular its ethical norms and values? Thanks. Colleagues from Piwe, it's lovely to see you and thanks for joining us from Cambridge. I, I really am grateful. Um, that's a very good question. So let me just say, um, to start with, I think that all theology is political theology. And I use the word um, politics in, in the sort of orig original sense, that the polis is the way in which we structure our common lives. 
and that whatever we choose to do, however we choose to live together, it has political implications. What I want us to be committed to is, is a kind of political theology that seeks the common good, um, that's built on inclusivity rather than exclusivity, uh, that operates with love and grace rather than in violence. So, so those kinds of commitments, which I think are the commitments of the Christian faith, uh, which we find certainly testified to in the scriptures and, um, and, and in many of the, 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 the church's traditions, and its work. So I want that kind of political theology. Um, and I think we can reasonably argue that that is the kind of uh, political theology that not only will align the church with the mission of God, but is also in the interest of the common good of society. But just to say, I think all theology has a political element to it. Um, so I'm not using it as a derogatory category as would have been done during apartheid. I think all theology is political and it's good to recognize that. Good. Thank you. I know we've got about four minutes left, but uh, Professor, if you have a few more minutes, I'm sure people who want to continue, can we can continue for a few more minutes. Um, I'm still going to take Liam Baker and then um, is it, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce Chil Chilkote and then Mr. Shambari. Um, I think we can take those three still before we close. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Prof Forster. Uh, thank you for the talk and the paper. It was very good. Um, I think from my point of view, I'm in a church that uh, thankfully doesn't have this kind of American uh, evangelical influence. Um, but I think a lot of people listening to the talk might be in a church where either some or all of the people in the church have adopted this kind of worldview. Um, yeah, what advice would you give for for me in my church if either the pastor or someone else I speak to and I, I can see that they have adopted this sort of thing? Liam, thanks very much. And and uh, that's that's a very good uh, question to ask, very difficult one to answer. Um, just to say, by the way, um, um, every single Christian tradition will have elements of earlier traditions or influences from other places present in it. So some may be influenced by Trumpism, others are influenced by colonial heritages, uh, others have been captured by a view of the economic world. Um, this is what Charles Taylor, the philosopher, calls uh, the, the, the sort of social imaginaries. All of us inhabit our world with a sort of sense of imagination. How does it work? What is good for the world? What are the boundaries of what we should and shouldn't do? My sense would be to say two things. I mean, I, I am deeply committed to, to um, a form of religion that I think has uh, the common good and the aims of, of the flourishing and the betterment of humanity and all of creation in mind. And wherever I see any kind of influence coming in that seeks to divide, to denigrate, to deny the dignity, to abuse, to separate, I begin to get a little bit uncomfortable with that. And that for me is a signal to say, spend a little more time living there, understanding it. Where is this coming from? What does it mean? You know, is this coming from a form of fear? Because uh, I know how it works in my own life. You know, I tend to associate with things that are in my own best interest. And, and so, you know, to spend a little bit of time with that. But my sense would be, you know, if, if one has a, a good relationship with the leadership of your church, uh, the pastor, the, the elders, etc., and you, you recognize that there are some things which are improper, you know, follow the, the guidance of Matthew 18, approach them directly, speak with them about what you find concerning. Uh, if you find that it's not resolved, bring some others with you to try and help you convince them. But but my sense would be don't just leave it unchecked. You know, religion is plays such an important role in many people's lives that if we don't deal with harmful beliefs and practices, um, they can be very destructive for individuals and societies. Paul. Yes, Dion, thank you so much for a, a stimulating um, an exceptional presentation. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, as an American Wesleyan theologian, I resonate uh, so much with your analysis and, and uh, your conclusions 
all the lines you've connected uh, with the African continent, et cetera. Uh, it's very compelling. Um, my question relates to fundamentalism. I don't think I ever uh, heard you in your presentation use that terminology. And my perception is that what has become known in an American context as evangelicalism essentially is now fundamentalism. Mm. And there is an impasse that a fundamentalist worldview creates that makes it almost impossible to penetrate. So my question is, in a, in a time in which fundamentalism is resurgent around the globe, uh, both in ideology and religion and politics, um, how might we uh, uh, navigate a, a time such as this? Yeah. Paul, thanks very much. And, and also to you for joining us from Cambridge. I, I appreciate that a great deal. And um, I, I can hear behind this, you know, a lot of your own work done in Africa and, you know, your, your own uh, costly work sometimes to yourself done done in the United States. I, I think I agree with you. There is a there is a, a form of fundamentalism, and I think part of what 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 I see happening in the world is because of the complexity of contemporary existence. You know, people being flooded with information. Um, we no longer live within our village where everything was clear and safe, and we understood everybody. Our cultures are you know, under threat, our identities are embattled. Um, this sort of collapse into, into fundamentals, the simplistic, the populist, uh, the comforting, the self-affirming, uh, that is happening. I mean, it's happening all, all around the world. And I, I think part of the work that we have to do, certainly for persons like yourself, what I see people like Marcia doing and others doing, is, is we have to be willing to hold the tension of complexity. Um, particularly in academic theologies, to say, let's not collapse it. And where we see this uncritical collapse, let's point it out. It's inadequate. It cannot deal with the problem. It may even be, be harmful. So I think the academic theologian has a very particular role to play in, in deconstructing uh, the oversimplification. I think that the church and church theologians have a slightly different role to play, which is more pastoral. It's dealing with the existential problems that people are facing and and a, a desire a need to find some sense of security some solid ground to stand upon and i think the the intention is the same thing but but the mechanism which is used to do that is is slightly different it may not be quite as as argumentative or reasoned it may be more pastoral uh spiritual patient in that sense thank you Thank, thank you, Paul, for that for that question. Then um, next up is Mr. Um, Shambari. Um, Dion, I don't want to go too much over time. We will have a recording available of this um, lecture that we will send to everybody afterwards, and I'm sure people can also contact you. Um, we've, we can see your email address there on the screen, Dion. So uh, so I'm sure if um, if there are more questions. Uh, you will be uh, more than happy. I'm talking on your behalf, but I'm sure Absolutely. you will be more than happy to to communicate and to discuss further. So we'll just take um, this last um, question and then we'll close off. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, um, for such a powerful presentation. I'm learning. Prof, I have two questions. The first one is on uh, prosperity gospel. I know this uh, subject is actually affecting uh, South Africa and other Southern African nations or some African nations, which I know, Zimbabwe included, where I come from. Prof, I want to hear from you. Is there any suggestion you can give in correcting this and whose responsibility it is? Is it for you who are responsible for teaching those who are going into the field? Is it for the general congregants to take a stance and know? Or is it a situation whereby we say heretics or heiress teachings can only be addressed with our teachings also? Mm -hmm. Question number one. Question number two is on the issue of um, 
our African theology. I understand we've got our um, uh, many efforts uh, being put in place, others ongoing regarding uh, reviving our um, establishing our African theology. Is it that we are totally wiped out with the American theology or we can still revive and have our own African theology that we can stand on? And is it possible that it will be accepted by our fellow Africans or will make relevance in the current uh, African theological setup or it's already too late? Thank mm. you so much, Prof. Colleague, thanks so much and uh, thanks very much for joining today. Uh, really am grateful that, that you did so and for those two questions. Okay, let's see the, the first one, this issue of the prosperity uh, gospel. Um, just to say there's a, 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 a person here at Stellenbosch, uh, Professor Ilana van Weyck, who's written quite, quite a bit on this as a sociological phenomenon. And I think that that's a very helpful way to approach this. My sense is that... Um, what we are seeing with, with this kind of prosperity teaching is that a vacuum has been left by um, what used to be known as the so-called mainline churches. You know, previously we actually did quite a lot around economics and physical health and well-being, but now we've given that over either to the state or the market economy. Uh, the state builds hospitals, they build schools, and the churches no longer engage in this kind of work. And these kinds of churches, these prosperity churches, sometimes are the only ones who are doing any work on a theology of economics or a theology of health. So it's not surprising that our members end up going there. Um, so my sense is one of the things that we need to do is we need to prioritize again for ourselves um, to do more responsible theology. Um, the one thing that I do want to say is that um, whose responsibility is this to correct it? I think this is the responsibility of theologians, certainly in the academy, but also of pastors in, in their churches. Um, we have to be very, very careful that we don't place neoliberal capitalism before the gospel, that somehow we equate uh, material wealth with blessing. I mean, that's a heresy, out and out, that we don't uncritically. I mean, I find it absolutely amazing that, that we don't have the imagination, the Christian imagination, to imagine a, a system, an economic system, in which we don't create such massive economic inequality, in which wealth and riches are not the measure of God's blessing or of a person's worth and success. So I think we've got to spend a lot of time really in, in that space, reimagining uh, what it means to, to, to truly flourish as human persons in, and, and in society. And just to say, we, we currently are, are being forced to do that. In South Africa, for example, we can't keep the lights on all the time. Um, we, we find that, you know, the, 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 uh, the kind of commitments we're expecting from our planet are not sustainable. So, so it's not only a religious matter, it's a very pragmatic matter that we have to deal with. In terms of African theology, this is a very interesting one. The question, what I heard part of your question there is, is it too late? Will our members accept it? Now, for me, the issue is, um, for me, it's not a matter of popularity. Will people accept something or not? For me, it's a matter of truth. If something is untrue, we, we must name it as such. So if we see, for example, that there is a form of, of political theology, economic theology um, that is colonized, imperialistic, that doesn't meet the needs of African persons, we must name it as such. Whether people accept that or not uh, is something that, you know, perhaps missiologists and evangelists and others have to work out. But as theologians, we have to be willing to 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 offer what we believe is a, a coherent, authentic, and as far as we are able to present it, uh, ethically responsible, morally responsible, and theologically true uh, uh, representation of what we believe uh, the faith is. So my sense is that that's not often popular work. You know, I do a lot of work, as, as many of you know, in what's called white work. Uh, that's not popular. <laughs> you know, uh, white South Africans don't like to hear about this, but it's important work. You know, whether it's popular or not doesn't matter. If it's important to do, I think we, we need to do that. So colleagues, let me end with that simply to say thank you very, very much for your engagement today and for this opportunity. And uh, to all of you who've joined, I, I really and truly appreciate that and much wisdom to you. Uh, for those of you in ministry and those theologians in your work, uh, thank you very much.